last week, everybody was on vacation. <laughs> so, so now it's like, it's nice to see everybody's come back to welcome me back. <laughs> this is good. This is really good. And uh, so, uh, did we did we mention uh, that Don and Judy had an anniversary last Sunday? Then we're mentioning it today. Don and Judy have an anniversary, right? Way to go. Uh, now, Judy, be honest. Has it felt like just a few days, or has it felt like eons? Yeah. <laughs> I knew she was going to say that. That's why I asked. It. Okay, and then, then right behind Don and Judy is this wonderful couple, Doug and Maria Whitmore, and they've got an anniversary on Thursday, this past Thursday. And I think, I think, uh, it's right around uh, 50 years, give or take up or down. Doug says a little bit under, by one year, how was that? I was thinking. 49. So give them a round. And then this doesn't ever happen, because usually I'm never around, but my birthday was just two days ago. Usually, usually I'm way far away at this time, but it uh, worked out and I came back sooner but had a wonderful birthday and with people I love and they were so kind and uh, got so many well wishes from folks I know from Ohio and different places. So made it very meaningful, very enjoyable. And I even got sung to as I was coming into a building. <laughs> Did not. Did not. Yeah, so I even got sung coming into a building. So it's good to see you all and it's good to be together. Um, don't have any announcements, but I do have prayer requests, and I got a, a, a little boatload of prayer requests. I'll kind of go through them, kind of rapid fire. Um, number one, uh, Annalie is going to have cataract surgery on Friday. So be in prayer for her to get through this thing without any complications. And then... Um, we had on our prayer list Betty Bailey. She's a neighbor in the senior citizen building where my mother-in-law is. A godly Christian lady. Her and her husband founded the Mount Zion Church up here on Jordan Road up on the hill. And so just a very lovely lady. Loved the Lord. And she was in hospice care the last time we had it posted. And I found out this past Tuesday she went home to be with the Lord. And I've talked to a couple of the daughters before her passing that were like, we're just looking forward to her finally being out of this and being home. So I know that's the sentiment of the family. And I didn't realize this, but her one son, I found out when I saw the obituary of the penny saver. Um, if you remember the Valley Inn down on Buffalo Street in Warsaw, <clears throat> Her son, Buzz, was the chef, yeah. Buzz Bailey. And I'm like, I didn't realize that. But now he's at the jail in charge of the kitchen there. And so that was quite surprising for me to know that. And then secondly, uh, uh, in the building where my mother-in-law is, she has a really nice neighbor named Dorothy on the same floor. And Dorothy suffered a stroke. And her left side is affected and she's just a very sweet lady and so she's in a hospital in Rochester and the family's going to try and get her into some type of a therapy unit to get some therapy but whenever you've got a whole side affected that's usually uh, not good for a stroke so really pray for Dorothy and then I had the chance uh, Friday I bumped into your sister-in-law Chris uh, Chris is uh, the wife of Denise's brother, Warren, and I've seen Chris around millions of times. She used to work at Walmart. She's since retired, so I've seen her hundreds of times. And just happened to be walking through the parking lot, and I ran into her, so I went right up and talked to her about Warren, because Warren's in the process of getting ready for kidney dialysis, 
So she said that shortly he's going to be getting the tubing in his arm, which will prepare him for that treatment. And uh, talked to her, and I said, you know, I can sympathize. I know Warren's not an easy guy to uh, manage. You, you're laughing. And she said, she rolled her eyes, and she goes, yeah, you know, and, and everything. She goes, and he was talking about, well, we can wait. And I'll just go on vacation, and then we'll come back. And she goes, no, we're doing it now. So she's got her hands full. So remember Warren and his wife, Chris, as she'll be the caregiver, caretaker in this process. Won't be easy. And then I talked on the phone yesterday to Karen McAdam, and she has fallen and has a concussion. So I ask that you pray for her that that mends. And then last but not least, Beth's friend Helen has her cancer surgery tomorrow. So that would be good to pray for you. Okay, so that's all the prayer requests. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, just so thankful and grateful for your blessings on uh, us as a body of believers and for the chance we have to gather today. It's, it's just good to be back with one another. <clears throat> And how much we enjoy seeing each other and the love that we know that flows from you into our hearts and flows out to each other. What a blessing it is to be a part of this family. And Lord, as we think about the family, we celebrate the special times. We think of Don and Judy celebrating another anniversary and Doug and Maria too. And we are so grateful and thankful to celebrate that with them. And then, Father, as we think about these requests that are in front of us, we do think of Anneli coming up on Friday, the surgery for cataract, and we would pray for that to go well, that you would, uh, there would be no complications in her end, and she would get through the procedure easily. We also, Lord, think of the Bailey family and the passing of Betty. We're thankful for her testimony of a godly Christian lady. And so we pray a blessing on the family as they make this transition in their lives. We also think of Dorothy, this neighbor uh, at the Senior Citizen Building that's had a stroke. Uh, Lord, we pray for her. We know that she's been a very kind woman to interact with. And we would pray right now in her time of need that you'd intervene and help her family, Lord, to step up and do what they can to help her in this crisis in her life. And we pray for Warren, Denise's brother, and his wife, Chris, as they face this journey together of treatments of kidney dialysis. We know that's just a very difficult treatment to deal with and go through on a weekly basis. So we would ask that you would work in their situation and strengthen them for the challenges that are ahead. And again, Lord, work in their lives through this. We pray for Karen McAdam, and we're sad to hear about the fall and the injury, but we would ask right now that you would help this injury to heal and help her or through the challenges in her life and the difficulties that she's dealing with. And then we also pray for Helen, Beth's college friend, that you would be with her in her surgery tomorrow. We understand that just so many difficulties and challenges ahead for this lady. And so we would pray that you give grace and strength to deal with every challenge that's ahead of her and her husband and family. We know you're going to answer each and every request in the way that you see fit, which is always the best. We give you glory, honor, and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's get out our hymnals and turn to number 153. Number 153. And once you get your place, I'll just ask you to join me in standing. And I also should say it's good to see Genevieve back feeling well. All right, 153.
tune is very, very, we're very used to the tune. It, we are. We are. Believe me, we are. So uh, Beth's going to play all the way through because she's never seen it before either. Uh, that's right. And uh, she'll play all the way through it and then you'll get a feel for how the tune goes.
they were really consumed with a lot of things going through their minds because they were starting to grasp the fact this is the final night. So he took everything he wanted to say and he kind of did this, he condensed it down. And so we're going to look at an example of that right here in John chapter 13, verse 30. We're going to go through verse 35. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. Of course, that's talking about Judas, the betrayer. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So what is the main point? It's a command. And it's not ten commands, and it's not five. It's one command. Kind of like Adam and Eve in the garden. They had one command. And what is the command? It's very simple. Love each other like Jesus did. That's it. That's the command. If we can do that, then others will know we belong to Him. That's a really good, knowledgeable thought for these disciples to carry on. But He wasn't through in talking about this point. Let's go forward in the account to chapter 15, verse 9. In this account, he seemed to add a little bit more, but never lost the main point. He kind of filled some things in around the main point, the command, but still, the main point is the command. So, John 15, starting at verse 9 and going through verse 17. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Again, he's really emphasizing the love of one another. Jesus said we are loved by him and we should remain in his love. And again, you stop and you go, how? How do I do that? Here's the simple answer. Obey his commands. That's it. When we obey his commands, the experience in our life will be this, joy. Joy comes from obeying His commands. The contrast would be this, and disobedience leads to what? Misery in our hearts and in our lives. The greatest command, according to Jesus, involves love for one another. Our obedience to this command to love is a powerful sign of what? That we are friends with Jesus. I mean, wouldn't you like for people to meet you out in public and say, there goes a friend of Jesus? How do you know? Have you noticed how they love? 
That's how I know. Now, again, this is the final night, and he's really emphasizing the love command. And in fact, he now brings it into a prayer. That's amazing. On this last night. Let's go to John chapter 17, the prayer. And verse 20. John 17, verse 20, and we'll read to the end of the chapter, verse 26. This is his prayer. We're just looking at just a portion of it. I do not pray for these alone, meaning the disciples that are in his presence, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me <laughs> may be in them, and I in them. That's the parting prayer of Jesus before everything happened. How does it feel to realize he not only prayed for these disciples, but for everyone that would be touched by their witness? And the reality is, all of us have been touched by their witness. You might say, how? Have you read the gospel accounts? That's their witness. So, all over the world, for 2,000 years, they've been witnessing. Even though they've not been here physically, they've been witnessing. What an amazing testimony of these disciples. Now, the parting prayer is all about love, which brings what? Unity. Love that brings unity. You see, loving unity is a great testimony to Jesus. And it's a great testimony to this fact that we are loved by God. The fact that love exists between us as brothers and sisters in Christ is a testimony to the fact we are loved by God. Now, again, these disciples had a great responsibility to pass this on to others in person. That first generation in the Roman Empire that would get this message. And again, as I looked at this, it's like, how is this exhibited among those living in the Roman Empire in that first generation as Christians? I mean, from the 12, which lost one, went down to 11, from the 11. And I think, it would be great to have the names that confirm the reality of these truths being practiced and by names more than just the apostles and more than just those that are attached to the apostles, but I'm talking about rank and file of people. That's what I want to see as evidence as to whether they kept this command or it just kind of fell by the wayside. Is there a testimony of people like this for all of us to judge if they have put the instructions of Jesus into practice. And the good news is, is two weeks ago we began to look at a list of names. Not names that are familiar to us, but names that are very unfamiliar to us. So let's go back to that journey. Let's go to Romans 16 to the list of names that testify about 
whether they're keeping the command or not. Now in Romans 16, we work through a portion of these names. So we're going to read just through the account of those that we've already touched on, and then we'll pick up where we left off. But we started in verse 1, and we worked our way down through verse 9 two weeks ago. So let's read through that. These are the beginning of some of the names. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Chenkria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you, for indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Very simply, folks, this is the lady that would take this letter to the Romans and would take it to them in person. And you go, oh my goodness, and this letter is being compiled in Greece. Greece and Rome aren't in the same locale, right? You look on a map, you'll see there's some distance there. And yet this was a woman that left her home to take this letter to the believers up in Rome, what Paul was writing. Again, you ask yourself, why would you leave your home, woman? and travel all that way over there to take this. And the only answer you can say is because of love. Love for other believers. We went on and we picked up at verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the church of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. This married couple came in contact with Paul and gave him lodging. And they not only gave him lodging, but they gave lodging to many believers by holding church in their home. And not just in one location, Rome, but also in Corinth and also in Ephesus. Everywhere they went, they opened their home up for the meeting of the body of believers. You go... Well, wouldn't it be a little inconvenient to open up your home for a meeting like that? Yes. Then why would you do it? Love. Love. In fact, they risked their lives to spare Paul from possible death. Well, why would you do that? I mean, you might die. Because of love. And he says, and all the Gentile churches are happy that they did that because that meant what? Paul would continue to live and serve. And the Gentile churches were really dependent on his service. Well, let's keep going. Verse 5 says, Greet my beloved Epinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Now, Epinatus, he's a well-loved friend. And there's a real bond between him and Paul. And you might say, what's the bond? In that locale, and we know Paul was a pioneer going to places that no other messenger went. Well, everywhere you go, there always has to be a first convert. And when you get the first convert, that's a sign more will probably come. And so this man was the first convert in that location. And that made a lasting bond between him and Paul. I'll never forget that was Paul's idea. I'll never forget Epinatus. He came and believed. And that did wonders for me because I'm in unknown territory. It's always good to see one come. And Epinatus would say, and I'll never forget you. It changed my life. Well, let's keep going. We come to verse 6. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. You ever notice in the New Testament there's a lot of Marys? And they have all something in common. And you might say, what is that? Service. When you see a Mary, you can know one thing. She's going to be serving. And this woman here, 
Notice what he said. She labored much for us. That means she not only served me, she served everybody in my group. Just one time? No. Continually. Why would you do that, Mary? Because of love. That's what Jesus said. We keep going there. We come to verse 7. Greek, Adronicus, and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. This is incredible. This is a couple that knew Jesus Christ before Paul did. Now, what's important about that? And they're also Jews. What's important about that? Paul was the terrorist. Meaning, he was wreaking havoc on the first believers. And probably, probably, Adronicus and Junia probably suffered a little because of it. But then Paul came to Christ, and they then what? They then became associated with Paul. You mean the terrorist? Yeah. Why would you hang around with that guy? I mean, he was killing Christians. And they would say, well, didn't Jesus tell us to love? Yes. We love him. You mean enough to go along into prison with him? Yes. You mean in prison where you get treated badly, you get beaten in prison? Yeah. Why would you do that? Because Jesus said to love. Pretty amazing couple, isn't it? Giving up their freedom for love. When we keep going here, we come to Greek, Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greek, Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. And Stachus, my beloved. Amplius was just a common, run-of-the-mill name in the Roman Empire. Okay? Common name. Kind of like probably today, Bill, John, Bob, Joe, you know, like that. But what stands out is Amplius is referred to as my beloved friend in the Lord. Meaning, this common man had uncommon service. Why would a common man like this rise to a level of service that was in the Lord? Because of love. Because of love. You got Urbanus. Urbanus is a name that's attached to Rome, the capital. That's a common name in Roman capital, okay? So that puts him in a location. Native of Rome. Did he meet Paul in Rome? No, Paul's never been to Rome. Not at this stage. So somewhere down the line, he met Paul. Now what's interesting is Paul says, our fellow worker in Christ. Now, if I'm thinking about somebody from the capital traveling over the Roman Empire, I'm thinking of this is a businessman, very possibly, and probably the head of a business. And here he comes into contact with Paul, and it would be real easy for the business type to demand what? Hey, put me at the top of the list, I'm somebody. But Paul says here, our fellow worker in Christ, meaning he just came into the group and said, just make me one of the number. Well, why would you do that? You're somebody. I mean, you come from Rome. You're an important person. Well, it's because of love. I mean, we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. I'm no what different than anybody else. I just want to help. And then there's Stachus, my beloved. Now, Stachus, the name means ear of grain. We would say ear of corn. Nice name, isn't it? Uncommon name. Yet, what stands out about him is this, a loved friend. You know, to be a friend of Paul meant what? You're asking for trouble. If you attach yourself to that man, you're going to have trouble. And here's Stachus. A man with an uncommon name that says, you know what? I'll be your friend. Why would you do that, Stages? You've got a good life. No trouble. Well, 
Jesus said love. And now what we're supposed to do? Of course. So now we pick up where we left off. We're down to verse 10. So look at verse 10. Greet a palace proved in Christ. And then greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. A palace is the Greek name that a Jewish person would take when they were enslaved in the Roman Empire. It was common in the Roman Empire for people to be enslaved. Many people of the early churches were held in slavery. In some examples, slaveholders and slaves worshipped side by side in those early church churches. Now, in spite of the ordeal of being enslaved, this individual had proven character worthy of the blessing of Christ. And you might say, how does a slave rise to that level? Well, listen to this portion taken from Peter's letter in the Bible, addressed to Christian slaves. Listen to what he writes. Slaves, you must respect your masters and do whatever they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are tough and cruel. Praise the Lord if you're punished for doing right. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong. But if you do right and suffer for it and are patient beneath the blows, God is well pleased. This suffering is all part of the work God has given you. Christ, who suffered for you, is your example. Following his steps, he never sinned, never told a lie, never answered back when insulted. When he suffered, he did not threaten to get even. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. Possibly this one had suffered for doing right with a noble attitude. Worthy of being identified with who? Jesus Christ. How Paul and this man crossed paths outside of Rome is a mystery. But his character, his behavior as a slave are no mystery. He's approved by Christ. Aristobulus is the name of a grandson to Herod the Great. This man would be wealthy while living as a private citizen in the capital. And he's a possible friend of the emperor through political ties. Oh, he's way up there. No doubt he would possess what? Slaves. Like the Jewish man named above. Other slaves in his possession, according to this, shared a similar faith in Christ. Herod the Great and his offspring were wicked people by reputation. The worst. You know, it was one of those sons of Herod that had John the Baptist beheaded. The Christian slaves of this household would not have an easy existence. But if a palace is an example of the others, what can you say? They're up to the challenge. And why would they live that way? Because of love. Jesus said to love. Look at verse 11. Greet Herodian, my country. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Herodian is a name which indicates a member of Herod's household. This could be a family member in the house of Aristobulus. Now, is it unusual to have a Christian associated to this political family? Herod? No. Luke writes, not long afterwards, Jesus began a tour of the cities and villages of Galilee, 
to announce the coming of the kingdom of God and took his 12 disciples with him. Some women went along from whom he had cast out demons or whom he had healed. Among them were Mary Magdalene. Jesus had cast out seven demons from her. Joanna, Chaza's wife. Chaza was King Herod's business manager and was in charge of his palace and domestic affairs. Susanna and many others who were contributing from their private means to the support of Jesus and his disciples. Let's go back to Joanna. Joanna didn't have any reservations about making her allegiance known even though her husband served Herod Antipas full time. That's amazing. Was this an easy association to balance in life? No! But this individual had no reservations about belonging to Jesus, even though they bore the name of what? Herod. I'm sure this person would be a comfort to the slaves in the household. Hey, we're not alone over here. Look over there. That's an actual family member. And they love Jesus like we love Jesus. And how do you think the slaves over here and the family member over here thought towards each other? Love. Love. Why would they love like that? Because Jesus said to. Narcissus is another political name in Rome. The full name would be this, Tiberius Claudius Narcissus. If you know anything about Roman history, the first two names belong to emperors. This man would have held the position of secretary to the emperor. Wow, we're really in the high echelons of the political circle. He determined appointments to be made and would have received kickbacks for his position. Oh, does that sound familiar? In government circles? This is a wealthy politician with many slaves. These are slaves in view here as Christians worthy of being acknowledged in a difficult environment. Now, what could stand out about slaves or family members in a dark political environment. Peter writes, the scriptures say he is the stone that some will stumble over and the rock that will make them fall. They will stumble because they will not listen to God's word nor obey it. And so this punishment must fall, must follow that they will fall. But you are not like that. For you have been chosen by God himself. You are a priest of the king. You are holy and pure. You are God's very own. All this so that you may show to others how God called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were less than nothing, now you are God's own. Once you knew very little of God's kindness, now your very lives have been changed by it. These people shine the brightest in dark settings and in dark times. They live distinctively compared to the wickedness around them. Their lives show God's handiwork in transforming them. They don't ask for much in return, except what? Just say hello. That's all you need to do to us. Paul, just say simply, hello. You mean, you don't want more recognition than that? No. Why not? Because we just love like Jesus told us to love. We're not seeking recognition. We're just seeking to love. Look at verse 12. Greek Tryphena, Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. These are the names of three women. The first two are likely twins. And you know what their actual twin names mean? Dainty and delicate. <laughs> Aren't those great names for twins? Dainty and delicate. But their actions are nothing like their names. What do you mean? 
They get their hands dirty in service to the Lord. As we often say, looks can be what? Deceiving. Persis is much love for her service in the Lord. And I think these three possibly worked as a team because they were of like minds concerning God's service. Persis could have been the team captain and very appreciated in Paul's sight. When I came here 22 years ago, there were three women that kind of were like this. Everybody's like, who, who, who? Uh, Genevieve Hare, Marion Whitmore, and Lois Lake. They were kind of like this. Right, Genevieve? Right on. And I really enjoyed them because they kind of fit these three in verse 12. By the time I got here, they were past their prime of service, I would say. Right, Genevieve? But that never stopped them. I have fond memories of all three. And the team captain is right over there. Okay? She's the team captain. Like Persis. But why did they do what they do? Love for Jesus and love for others. That's really what it boils down to. Look at verse 13. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Here's an interesting name with some history attached to it involving Paul. You might say how? Mark wrote his gospel account in Rome sometime after this letter was spread throughout the capital of Rome. This name appeared in the gospel account as follows. Okay, listen. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. The father of Rufus helped carry the cross of Christ the final part of the way. This wasn't the only thing that Simon was known for, according to Luke, the man that carried Jesus' cross. There's more. Listen carefully to what Luke wrote later. The believers who fled from Jerusalem during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch scattering the good news, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene also gave their message about the Lord Jesus to some Greeks. And the Lord honored this effort so that large numbers of these Gentiles became believers. Folks, Simon was a native of Cyrene. Now listen to the next piece of information recorded by Luke gets even more interesting. Among the prophets and teachers of the church in Antioch were Barnabas and Simeon, or we would say Simon, also called the black man. Lucius from Cyrene, Manane, the foster brother of King Herod, and Paul. One day, as these men were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Paul for a special job I have for them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. Simeon carried the gospel to Gentiles in Antioch, which became a church. The man that carried the cross. And then he served in the church at Antioch alongside Paul. He was among the leaders that heard God do a single out Paul for missionary service. And then he and the others commissioned Paul to go to other Gentile lands. Oh. And Paul said, What? Rufus is chosen in the Lord. What exactly does this mean? This man lived with a famous father in the faith. It's 
it's hard to distinguish ourselves from a famous relative in anything, right? Many simply choose to what? Live off the coattails of someone like this instead of doing anything noteworthy in life. Did you notice that Paul didn't write Rufus, son of Simon, in his letter? Why? Rufus has distinguished himself in the faith in spite of this wonderful bond to his father. He lived a noteworthy life in Christ. And what about this comment concerning the mother of Rufus? Well, it wouldn't be hard to figure out that Paul lived under the roof of Simon and his family in Antioch when Barnabas brought him there. And therefore they treated him like one of their family. For how long? Paul served in Antioch for a year or longer. Oh, wow! Now Rufus and his mother, after all that time, have surfaced again. Where are they? In Rome. Doing what they originally did what? In Antioch as a family. Many years have passed since that time, but the bond in Christ remains strong. Why did they do what they did for Paul? Love. That's why you open up your home to a brother or sister in Christ and say, come on in. I'll feed you. I'll care for you. I'll take care of you. Look at verse 14 and 15. Great. Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them, Greek Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Now it seems here we have two separate house churches being addressed with the prominent names being singled out as leaders of the two groups. So this now makes, in this account, starting from verse 1, this now makes three house churches, counting Priscilla and Aquila. What's going on at Rome? These believers are doing the work of ministry by spreading the word to others and seeing more and more join their lives. It's a team effort to accomplish what they are doing. And they have to work together. You mean, I gotta work with him? Yes. I gotta work with him? Yes. But that's not their attitude. Their attitude is, I get to work with him? Yes! I get to work with her? Yes! It's different, isn't it? Why do they feel that way? Love. Jesus said, love. Love like I do. That's what they're doing. So with that in mind, look at the final instruction, verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ agree. The warmth of those in Christ should be evident to neutral observers every time they visit the meeting. This warmth among believers testifies to the reality of Jesus in us. Now, the great news is, okay, we've got Jerry and Joyce all the way from Arcade coming up here to sit among us. So they've had a chance to really observe, is there love in that group? I hope we're passing the test. I hope we're passing the test. But it's great to have folks like that come in amongst us. Hey, and over here on my right is my good buddy Jeremy with Devin. He may come in a little bit longer than you all have. Okay? But they've had a chance to observe What's going on? Is there love here? That's what anybody coming through these doors needs to see. Is there love here? Is this a place that practices loving like Jesus? That's what needs to be seen. And then here again he says, 
all the churches in the Roman Empire have a common purpose to fulfill. You see, warmth is not limited to individual meetings like this, but among all the churches to have that love for each other. They genuinely know Jesus. The question we have to consider about these early believers involves the evidence. What is the evidence? concerning their obedience to the command of Jesus to love. What does the evidence show? Are they obeying his command? Let me ask you, what does the evidence show? Are they obeying his command? What say you? Yes? I think so too. Now, what can we do to continue what they started? loving like Jesus. I mean, I know it's easy for us to start thinking, oh yeah, I'm doing this, this, and this. And that's good. But I always think when it comes to loving like Jesus, Jesus was never satisfied to stop at a certain level of love. That's what I think. I think Jesus was always looking for a way to increase. So that's my challenge. How can I increase the love and fulfill the command of Jesus? How can I do it? And I don't need to tell you. You just need to lean on the Lord and say, Lord, lead me. And I'll know. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. We're just thanking you for this wonderful roster of individuals that have been listed by the Apostle Paul. And we've just scratched the surface of their lives as best we could from all the aids and things that we can find that help us do a little bit of research on these names. Some names are more familiar because they've showed up maybe in the scriptures more than once. Others are only showing up now. And that's it. But yet the fact that the Apostle has mentioned all these names, it's a good indication to us of the love that was being shown towards him and from him to them. And we see Father before us a great example of Father to put into practice in our lives here. We want to love like Jesus. That's the command. And we want to obey give you glory, honor, and thanks for reminding us of our obligation and our responsibility. But yet, it's something that we shouldn't approach in a manner as, oh, it's a duty and I got to do it. No. It's something that we need to approach in a better spirit. A spirit that says, I want to do it. I want to love this way. Thank you, Father, for being so kind to have these things recorded for us to read and study. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to go to hymn number 92. It's a familiar hymn for you. It talks about loving Jesus, but I would really have you actually focus on how Jesus loved. And this hymn talks about how Jesus has loved. Because we're to love like Jesus. Okay, so hymn number 92. We're going to sing the first, the second, and the fourth. And each verse talks about how Jesus loved. Let's see if we can take from that and do something with it.
ideas on that. All right, Guy, would you lead us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today's message. We thank you for the, the names that we've seen listed, some that we recognize, some that are strangers to us, but many who served you in capacities that were recognized by Paul and commended by Paul for these things. And I just ask as we go out today that each of us thinks about this and thinks about the, the way that we love you, your son, and those around us. And whether we meet the expectations that Paul had in being commended, and whether we're worthy of that commendation, commendation for it. the love that we show to those around us and to you and to your son. I just ask that we think about this through our day, through our week, and just think about the things that we can improve to be more loving to each other and to you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.